Hi, my name is Riza Santos, host of Studio Luma's show, Illuminate. Today, our guest is Lost Decades. We'll have them open the show with a performance, then we'll do an interview and get to know them, and then we'll have them close the show with another performance.
I am here with Lost Decade. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Of course. Thank you for coming to the show today. So I'll have you introduce yourselves individually. I'm Derek. I play bass. <laughs> Drum machine. I'm, oh, I'm Chanel. I'm a singer. I'm Brandon, and I play keyboards. Nice. So we have Lost Decade here. Now, why don't you let our viewers know how you guys came up with the band name Lost Decade? Ooh, um, well, that's a tricky one. We had a bunch of names. Me and Brandon have been doing a lot of things for a long time, and we played a lot of gigs under a lot of different names for a really long time. And Lost Decade was, I don't know, we had a list of 20-some songs between the three of us that we just started throwing around. And Lost Decade same appropriate because of the COVID thing. Because it's kind of like that, but it's also part of it is me and Brandon spent a long time looking to try to find a singer, and it took us probably 10 yeah. years to yeah. do it. So it was Better probably part of yeah. So it was kind of appropriate there. So there was a lot of meta kind of going on with uh, the choice. I'm also a fan of Japanese stuff, and um, there's a long historical thing with the lost decade in Japan and their culture and what happened with some of the financial collapses and things that happened there. Anyways, that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really interesting. It's a, quite a bit of a backstory. Some layers. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been together as a band? I think it's been about like... Right before the like COVID, COVID lock. So, yeah. yeah, so mm -hmm. like, I think the first gig that we did was the Halloween before. Yeah, so maybe yeah. Uh, 2019. Yeah. Yes. It's like, yeah, it would have been October. Um, yeah. It's longer than, we, you know, COVID is like skewed what time is too. Mm -hmm. So now mm. I can't realize like how many years has Oh, I know. Last I've bit. lost track of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, we're in 2022. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, and because of our jobs, like we both, both me and Chanel and Brandon, we all do different things outside of music. So we don't get to get together very often, right? So it's been kind of like prolonged and prolonged. Like there might be weeks or months even between really? like when we get together. Wow. So it's a long process, right? And I that, wouldn't have thought that because the way you guys perform, it's just so natural. And it's, I would have thought you, you practice all the time. We're getting better at doing that. But the first like, yeah, probably year, it was like, okay, COVID happened. You know, let's say I where I work, I worked a couple outbreaks. So I was like, well, I'm not going to come see you guys for a long period of time. And hopefully we can work on things separately and then come back together. So yeah, at first it was definitely a start stop type thing. And Brandon and I also play in other bands too. So sometimes scheduling can be a challenge, but um, yeah, now we're at this state where we're, yeah, we're definitely a, a proper unit now, I think. And <laughs> yeah, we definitely do our best to make sure we see each other a lot more often. Oh, that's great. So where does the inspiration come from for your music? Ooh, lots of places. Um, and actually, um, when I finally, you know, found Chanel uh, through uh, another band I was playing in, well, actually her brother's band. <laughs> oh, okay. um, it was, uh, you know, sort, sort of one of those things where we were just shooting the breeze in the green room on a set break or something. And yeah. it was you know, probably a wedding gig or something. And, uh, um, you know, just, of course, musicians, you know, hanging around talking about music, huge shock. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, we just started, you know, talking about like, what are you into? And, and, uh, um, and I was amazed that she had even, you know, heard of some of the weirdo, obscure old eighties stuff and some of the things that I listened to. So right off the bat, I was like, okay, okay. Like, um, you know, Derek had mentioned some of the, other, uh, you know, singers we had worked with in the past. And, um, you know, we worked with some great, talented and enthusiastic people. But uh, um, when it comes to, you know, even conceptualizing, like starting a band from the ground up, like you kind of have to have some idea of what type of band it is, even though that can totally change. You might start as a punk band and wind up as a, you know, electronica band or something, but you have to start somewhere. And with us, you know, we already kind of had this really specific idea and Chanel was the first person that was like, yeah, I totally get what you're talking about. And so it was like, oh, oh okay. Well, <laughs> and I, I remember calling up Derek like like the day after being like, dude, I, 
I think I finally found someone. And <laughs> oh, this sounds so cute. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty funny because I didn't want to get like you know too excited, but at the same time, I was like, okay, you know, finally, you know, we were making some headway here because um, that's that's probably what stops so many projects in their tracks from even starting is just finding that you know right combination of people and, and, and like the influence, right? Like mm. the the '90s kind of how when 90s hip hop was sampling all the stuff from the 80s, we liked the stuff from the 80s. Mm -hmm. And like the things that like Biggie would sample and like Puff and all the things, right? Like those guys would sample just the tightest jams and we're like, damn man, why we want to play that. Like, and so like we'd like Evelyn King and like Luther Vandross and like the things that most people you talk to these days, if they're younger, they don't know who the fuck you're talking about, right? Like they're like, what, what? <laughs> And and then Chanel knows all of the things, like right. And you're like, man. So to find someone that's into that music, like that's the why it works. I think, right? Because like trying to push our style on someone else that's not into it, right? Like that's a that's a messy thing, kind of, right? And and that's fine because if you're trying to meld the things, and so part of it is kind of melding new in with the old because like some of the how we produce kind of our our songs are kind of a mixture of old like because we're using a lot of old analog drum machines and old analog keyboards like with the show that we did here like right Brandon mm -hmm. was using a bunch of old stuff and we're using a bunch of old apps to put in to get the right sound that we're trying to get to achieve for that vision Oh, wow. is. interesting. Is it hard to find that equipment? We've you're had working it. with older equipment. <laughs> we're, we're, we're old. Yes. So <laughs> well, we're, uh, we, we're, well, yes and we've no. We've been collecting it for a long time. We're, we're, we're old, but we're not as old as our equipment is. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, <laughs> like, well, fortunately, like I, I had some past experience. I, I used to work at uh, the keyboard museum here in town. And um, I, uh, you know, I've, ever since I can remember, been really obsessed with the uh, you know, well, keyboards, but, you know, probably ever since junior high, like really into the old stuff. And, you know, that came with the, the old music and realizing, you know, what stuff they made this on. And, um, you know, that was in the days like when eBay was just, you know, kind of getting going and, and before reverb and uh, before, you know, kind of the, the saturation of uh, um, stuff on the Internet. So like you could still crack open the newspaper classifieds and, you know, occasionally find someone who was selling something old that had no idea what it was. And like, you'd, you'd be speeding, you know, like, like to the dude's house, like trying to, trying to beat the other hipsters there to, you know, get this raging deal on like some drum machine or keyboard or something. And, um, you know, me and, uh, our you know, friends we went to school with, um, like we spent quite a lot of time and uh, the gear obsession and man. effort. Yeah. It's, it, it is an obsession. And yeah, you collect and that's, you that's do. it, right? You do, but um, but also you realize what uh, what stuff um, you know is actually useful versus what you know has has sort of a lore and a hype built around it, and um, so I was very fortunate that you know I've I've probably tried out more keyboards and synths and drum machines than uh, than a lot of folks in my position, just you know out of sheer dumb luck basically. But uh, um, you know that all goes in the memory database of like okay now I know like what to kind of set the sights on. And mm -hmm. Do you find that you get a different sound using that type of equipment? Yes. Uh, although, I mean, like New I was saying, software. There's, yeah, there, there, there's, there's sort of a, uh, trying to separate yourself from uh, the, the lore and the, um, you know, the, the, just the, the cool factor basically of having the old stuff. Um, because yeah, like Derek said, they're like the plugins and the stuff on the computer nowadays is, is amazing mm -hmm. um but you know you don't get the feel on old analog yeah. stuff like like yeah. if you're in a box and you're doing it and you're using a midi controller there's, there's like a feel to it and it's like you can get good results right like all every lots of people play in the box right of course mm -hmm. but well, with our setup it's just like that analog when you're touching it and there's there's just something about the analog that just makes it i don't know I harder to record but like 15 ish years ago when Derek and I were in music school, um, like the in the box thing was just like kind of in its infancy where- yeah, And it sounded horrible. And it sounded awful, yeah. Like I remember like him and I, like we took engineering together and um, we were some of the only people in our class that like really put in time in the studio to like, 
um, you know, mess around with all the outboard gear and the stuff that was outside of the computer. And like, we'd just, you know, ply our drummer friends with beer or whatever to come play drums for hours on end while we just, you know, moved microphones around and just messed around and, um, you know, like did all that experimentation that, you know, like they, it's one thing to go to a school and, and they can tell you all the theory behind stuff, but, um, you know, like you can't really teach the knowledge that's gained by just sitting there with a pair of headphones and moving a mic stand around and just hearing what happens. And uh, yeah, old, old engineering was a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. right? Like, like old studio stuff, like you would sit there for hours and hours trying to get the right tone. You might do it for days and days to get that right sound that you're trying to get. And nowadays it kind of, everyone's kind of got their own plug-in chain, right? Cause they're, most mm -hmm. people do doing everything in the box. So you kind of have this, cookie cutter thing where you can just kind of crap out songs and that's what like a lot of people do um especially that that's kind of like the whole industry now i guess right is like you got to just keep releasing and releasing and releasing old right the old 70s and even 60s even the 80s like you'd have bands that would release one album every 10 years or something right and they would last that whole time but now you're like one artist is making one album and if they don't make an album the next year they kind of fade off and, and never come back right Mm -hmm. you, so you have a lot more of those one hit wonders or whatever it is. And I'm not saying you are. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it like in the studio with you guys? You have so much experience producing. We do it in our house. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, and, and, and it's always had that kind of um, DIY spirit. Cause I think, I think one of the things like, I, I like uh, when I know that uh, when I started to actually get, into some nicer studios um i was really enamored with the setups and and the you know the nice equipment but um um but it was always that that sort of snooty attitude of like oh our, our this this is the you know the a studio sort of uh, mentality and it was always the worst places that like had the the biggest egos and uh, <laughs> um you know the people are like oh yeah this this is Calgary's A studio. And you're like, sure, buddy. You know, like pe people do this in their bedroom now. Like, uh, and you know, that's, that's the reality is that, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, the technology has really democratized uh, this to the point where, um, you know, you in decades past, you had to have an AR person at a record label, you know, deem you worthy enough. Um, you know, they'd go to your gig at the bar and, you know, if they thought your band was good enough to be recorded, they'd, uh, you know, be like, oh, give me your demo tape. And um, you'd start this long process of like, well, we'll, uh, you know, get you signed and, and everything like that. But these days, a lot of people are just skipping the process and, you know, going right to YouTube and to, um, you know, other things online and, and getting discovered in that modern sort of viral way that bypasses all the, um, you know, which I think is great because you know why should some cigar chomp in the uh, uh ceo at a record label who's you know clearly past their prime decide what's hip and um you know i think that's why you have a lot more choice nowadays mm -hmm. but it's a double-edged sword too and you got all this stuff to sift through and you know yeah there's definitely so much more music now than there i feel like there was than ever before totally because the barrier to entry is you know, it's not like before when there was just so many restrictions and you had to know the right people. Yeah. And I, I think it's great because like now you can't really use the excuse of, um, oh, well, I, I just haven't met the right producer. Or I haven't, uh, um, you know, you know, I just haven't hit my big break yet because if you have the music in you, you know, and this is what I constantly tell people that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if anyone comes up to me at a show and it's like, wow, I, I, I want to get into this. And it's like, well, then do it. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you probably already own a computer. Mm -hmm. And there's less barriers than there's ever been right now. Right? And yes. But it just means that you need to focus, right? Like you need mm -hmm. to like find the genre you like and then you want to like, right? Like you can't get into every genre now like you can't listen mm. to everything there's just so much stuff on there and if you start doing the youtube scrolling then you get sucked down the rabbit hole and you're gone man like you're <laughs> you're out there and it'll take you to something that you don't ever knew and you're like oh man that's, that's kind of cool actually but it's usually related to everything else because of the algorithms right that are feeding you different material just like news feeds and things right 
So. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys have a very unique sound. Where did that, yes. is, is this out of interest that you gravitated towards this genre? It's, it's hard to say really. Cause like we, this, this is like, actually when uh, Derek and I were going to school, um, like we definitely listened to this type of music, but, uh, um, all the bands we played in were, you know, like more seventies jazz, like acid jazz, boogaloo type music. Um, yeah, we were jazzers. Yeah. You know, like, like play lots of stuff with horns and, you know, all, all kinds of things. And, um, like uh it was a it was a logical like step so like because when we kind of started and we met to each other we were in like the 50s and 60s mm. then we kind of started doing more band stuff and like some like disco and we moved to 70s then we got to the 80s we kind of just stuck there in the 80s and maybe a little bit of 90s because we grew up in the 90s so we mm. like that and then that's that's kind of where chanel came along was just kind of like the she also likes all of those things and mm. it's like well we don't need to go further back we'll just stay <laughs> in the 80s and try to make it a little bit 90s and maybe a couple of little modern things as we when we play live we want to try to play like a new song every time we play a live show we'll cover right like mm. so we'll have our whatever it is 12 songs or so that we have so far and then we try to do like last time we played, we did a BTS song, which was fun. Oh, like, wow. I, I like BTS. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and I know Chanel loves BTS oh, they're as so well. Cute. Mm -hmm. right? uh, they're so cute, right? So weak. They're they're just so handsome. It's true. right. They're, yes, they're, it's they're, true. they're so pretty. <laughs> what type of music do you like to sing, Chanel? Um, I've been through everything. So uh, they went to a different music school, but I went to music school as well. So I started with doing classical and um but it's been since i've been in calgary uh played it in hard rock bands i've been in soul bands kind of like covered so many different genres and um growing up as a child my parents were just all about you know everything my dad is like a hard rock lover he will you know push led zeppelin and um Black Sabbath on you, and I grew up listening to that, but I'm also from Trinidad and Tobago, so Soka and Calypso are, like, just a big part of me and part of my culture, so that's also something that just drives me. So, yeah, I'm in this band, and we all kind of pull from the many influences that are, like, well, that have inspired Her dad us. also influences what we do, because oh, we've really? done <laughs> yeah, one show we covered. A lot of the covers that we do are just songs just like my dad would love them. So maybe <laughs> oh, like, yeah, so we did like oh, a Cars so cover, which is like from the eighties, and then recently for his birthday, yeah, for his birthday, we we recorded and did some live shows, but we were doing some Smiths, yeah. so we did a Smith song for him and recorded it, and uh, yeah, it's it's, it's yeah, fun. my family actually, my, my parents are a huge influence on uh, me as a musician and the type of music that I sing and listen to. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's all over the place for sure, but um. Well, it probably goes yeah. for, for all three of us. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I, I know my parents had a really eclectic taste in music. And, you know, one minute my dad had Gilbert and Sullivan, like, you know, like old, like, operas on. And next thing he was bumping Men Without Hats or, uh, you know, like, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Dire Straits yeah. or just all <laughs> over the place. So, you know, I had a very good, you know, variety of things. And that's usually what it is. Like, oh, for right? sure. it, it, My dad's the same way. Yeah. For, mm. He always had things on. My mom's pretty tone deaf, but... <laughs> she liked the same stuff anyway. So. Well, it sounds like you all come from very musical families. Mm -hmm. That's so great to hear. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. Do you have a message you'd like to share with your fans and our viewers? Um, if you want to make music, do it. Now is the time. Get into it. Get some software. Get yourself some free synths. Go on vstforfree.com and download some synths. <laughs> <laughs> Some good advice. Yeah, Stay nothing. safe. Yeah, live long and prosper. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's good advice too. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lost Decade. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.